You are deserving of happiness. You are deserving of healing. You are deserving of joy. Whatever your dream is, whatever your passion is, work towards it. And put God first. God has to be in your life. I wanted to use the skills and the training, hopefully, to advocate on behalf of the community. I'm able to say that on Chop It Up. Be prepared to, to keep it real. Hello and welcome to the Chop It Up Podcast, the show that's unfiltered and unapologetic. Each episode will bring you closer to finding your purpose, so be sure to listen all the way through. Now, here's your host, Carmisha Superville. Guys, we made it. <laughs> we made it. Happy New Year to all of you. I hope you all had a wonderful um, holiday season as we put 2023 to rest, as we walk in to the New Year. Happy 2024. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited for an even year. Um, as you know, it's your girl, your host, Kamisha Superville. And as you all know, the Chop It Up podcast is all about life, leadership, and legacy. Guys, because this is the first episode of the new year, I had to bring you an amazing quality guests. And guys, I am so honored to have this conversation. And I know you will be truly moved by this conversation. And more so, as you're thinking of the new year, some of you may have created resolutions. Some of you may have been manifesting a new life, a new journey. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's about reset. How do we press that reset button as we usher in a new year? So guys, welcome back. This episode, we're going to entitle it Reset. Absolutely. And my guest for this conversation is the renowned Hollywood producer, director, writer, and on-air talent. We will be speaking with Bill Adelon, William Adelon. I am so honored to have this conversation with this distinguished guest. Bill is also the president of Waverly Motion Pictures. He's also the president. Bill, how are you? Happy New Year. Well, Happy New Year to you. Glad to be with you. Now, I'm not sure how renowned I am as a producer. I do do all of that stuff but kind of in my own venue, working out of Boston. And I have Hollywood contacts, and I've had a good time in the career, but uh, I'm not sure that I would be up there at the at the head of the renowned list, in my own mind, perhaps, but I'm not sure um, among others. Absolutely. So you don't think you're like a Steven Spielberg? Well, I'm seasoned all right. Heck, when I started in this business, I had hair and everything. <laughs> uh, and I've been at it for, you know, 45 or 50 years. So I figure in another 10 or 12, I'm really going to know what I'm doing. Right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I enjoy it. I've had a really wonderful career. I've been involved in every single aspect of film and video production. I'm happy they just let me keep doing it. And uh, I like it well enough. So I don't ever really see retiring. As long as I can, you know, look at a screen, pick up a camera, do some editing, I'm going to be involved. I love that. And you know what, Bill, let me just tell you, you are renowned because I think you said something that was so pivotal. You said that you've been doing this for many years, for 40 plus years. You have maintained this career. You have maintained this passion. You have worked in so many different passion projects, but you have maintained longevity. And I think that in itself is the definition of being renowned and of course many other things but let's talk a little bit about reset we are in a new year 2024 and being that you have been on this career journey for so many years i would like to ask as our listeners are also thinking about their career path we have some folks that may be feeling stuck in their career may not be feeling fulfilled in their career what would be your advice to folks that's just trying to figure out life? Well, I'm, I, you know, from a, from the get-go, from back in high school, <clears throat> I was doing film, playing around with films. I've done it all my life because it's something that I love. And so when the days get very long, 
uh, you know, 16, 18, 20, I've done all nighters, okay, editing and so forth. Um, it's really because I've loved it. Even when I wasn't getting paid that much, I loved it. So I always recommend to people, gosh, find something that A, you love, B, because you love it, you're good at it. And be willing to take chances. And right now is an interesting time for that because, of course, unemployment is at the lowest that it's been in 60 years. People are able to shift jobs. They're able to say, you know what? I really wasn't loving this much and I'm not getting paid enough <laughs> to force myself to do it. So I'm going to, you know, I've got a couple of ideas and I want to I want to branch out a little bit and I'm going to take a chance at this point. And so people are making shifts in their jobs. I know this from friends of mine. Um, so from that standpoint, it's not a terrible time to uh, sort of step back from what you're doing if you don't really like it and pursue something that you genuinely love, uh, whether it's creative or business related or, you know, making something with your hands or acting, or uh, singing, or whatever. I don't know. I just, I can't imagine having done what I do for as long as I've done, and not having loved it. I learn something new on every single project I undertake, and that's kind of exciting. And I, it makes me feel like I'm always kind of moving forward. I'm always learning something new. And that's the most, frankly, appealing aspect of filmmaking, as far as I'm concerned. I agree, definitely. I think finding your passion and finding a way of, you know, either monetizing that passion or growing in that passion is definitely key. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about kind of like who you are, you know, for our listeners who may not necessarily know of your work or your background. Who is the Bill that's, you know, 17? Tell, tell us a little bit about your story, your background. Well, I started, I was playing around with eight millimeter film back in high school in uh, growing up outside of Scranton, Pennsylvania, in the town of Waverly, little small little New England type town in northeastern PA. And I just got interested in eight. This was eight millimeter film. This was before Super 8 was invented. OK, so um, my parents got me a little movie camera and I was playing around with it, doing uh, kind of coming up with skits to do with my friends. I was in Boy Scouts. Actually, the one thing I have in common with Steven Spielberg is that he and I both got involved in Boy Scouts. If you've seen his latest film, uh, The Fabermans, it's about how his he had a bit of a dysfunctional family, but he got involved in Boy Scouts and he was filming, making up little scenarios to film with his fellow Boy Scouts. I did the same thing. I was doing the same thing at roughly the same time. And uh, I continued to do it. I worked in projects that I could do in high school for uh, earth science and history and so forth. I was doing stuff with little plastic dinosaurs, and you know, with the camera on a tripod and uh, moving them around in a little dinosaur motif. I was just finding excuses to tell stories and to fulfill homework assignments uh, <laughs> using this camera. And I kept doing it through high school. Nobody was really making films, in little independent films back in the 60s, in the mid to late 60s. So, uh, you know, I was probably an attractive prospect for some colleges. It was like, oh, this guy's making films. So I got into a good, you know, Ivy League school but they didn't have a film program. Uh, I had to kind of do it myself. Uh, I got, uh, by then I was able to use 16 millimeter equipment, still film, not video, not, you know, digital was, digital was 20, 30 years later, but film, which was expensive because you had to buy the film from Kodak and you had to have a camera to shoot it. And then after it's shot, you have to get it to a film lab, a professional film lab to have it developed. And that was expensive. And you had to make a work print copy. So it was expensive. So I figured out ways when I was in college to pay for my own projects by farming myself out as a news cameraman to some of the New England TV stations. By I, was a, I had grown up skiing. So I ended up uh, convincing uh, the skiing legend Warren Miller that I could film on skis and I shot sequences uh, for his annual documentary films and I shot at the ski areas all over New England uh, at one point Good Morning America had me filming President Ford 
uh, out at Vail because I was pretty good at skiing with a film camera. Uh, but I was really doing that more to make my own films, you know, to, to learn about t storytelling. I was going to be an actor until I realized there was nobody else to be behind the camera at that point. So I had to kind of move around behind the camera and start to get into more directing and editing and so forth. So that was kind of the genesis of it. And I never quit. I uh, I was making ski films when I graduated. I moved to Boston, was working with the ad agencies. I became a hot director of TV ads and that never lasts for very long. You're only hot. You're only the new person for a while. Uh, but that led to longer films, marketing films. Uh, I did uh, end up having uh, a connection with Hollywood and that there were several shows that were set in Boston. Uh, it, there was a hospital drama called uh, St. Elsewhere that uh, introduced oh, just an amazing number of talented actors. It was their first gig. Denzel Washington, right, was in St. Elsewhere. Uh, Alfre Woodard uh, was, you know, uh, Mark, uh, I'm trying to think of the guy who stars in, uh, you know, a couple of, t Mark Harmon uh, was in it. Uh, Howie Mandel was in it. It was all these up and coming young actors and they were all playing doctors and so forth. It was shot in Boston. They shot it on sets out in Los Angeles, but they needed somebody to shoot Boston scenes for the show. And sometimes they'd even bring the talent in. And some of the people who were doing that show ended up working on the, on the sitcom Cheers, which was a huge, you know, number one hit also set in Boston. So I ended up being in a position to, to set up the crews and do the filming with the cast when they would occasionally bring the cast to Boston. And I worked with, you know, the top sitcom, sitcom director ever, Jim Burroughs, who directed, you know, a million different, you know, one, the Mary Tyler Moore show and uh, Taxi and Friends and all these wonderful uh, shows that he, you know, brought out performances from the actors. And he was the guy they brought back to, you know, and I was the producer and the cameraman for this, for all, this, all the bits shot in Boston, and I could watch him and learn from him. And uh, then there was Newhart TV, where he played, he owned the inn in Vermont, and I would do all the Vermont shooting. And David E. Kelly had a series of legal shows uh, set in Boston, Ally McBeal, uh, yes. Boston Public, The Practice, uh, a high school based show called Boston Public. Uh, Boston Legal was the one I mentioned before. Um, and they would shoot them out in Los Angeles, but they still needed a lot of, of Boston and New England uh, footage. And sometimes they'd bring the, the talent along to shoot. Uh, and then that led to work for the Gilmore Girls. I would do the Connecticut, Yale filming for the Gilmore Girls, Bones in Washington. You know, the one thing I've learned is that when you deliver for one of these people, word gets around. I was about to ask that. I was like sitting here amazed at one thing led to the next and the next job and the next gig. And I was about to ask that in relation to what you were about to say, word gets around when you do quality work. Like wh what do you think is the key in terms of longevity and in terms of working? Well, I, first of, you know, I always try to over deliver. Whatever these people are, whatever this producer in Hollywood is expecting, I'm just going to hire this guy from Boston and he's going to shoot this. It's like, I, I don't want him to just think of me as this guy from Boston. I wanted them to go, wow, this guy really, you know, he gave more footage than we thought that framing was great. The, you know, I just over delivered and consequently word would get around and other producers would call and say, Hey, Mike said you did this for him. Could, uh, you know, can, can you shoot the scenes for this new show? The good doctor that we're doing. It's, it's set in San Jose. Uh, if you could do all of the atmosphere for it, that would be great. And we could plug it into the show. So uh, word of mouth. Uh, and, you know, I use well, young people who are getting into the business who ask me for advice. I say, well, well, a couple of things. Remember that whoever hires you, technically, you're in the ass protection business. You protect the ass of the person who made the decision to hire you. Make that person look good. When they go to everybody else and say, look at this, what I got from this guy shooting this. That is as much of my story as any. And I always tell folks who are interested in getting into the business too, don't complain about the occasional 16 or 18 hour day. Expect it. 
it's going to happen in our business. Embrace it. Uh, from that standpoint, it's a good idea to try to keep yourself in reasonably good shape because filmmaking is sort of by definition a fair amount of physical labor and mental labor because yes. even in the 18th hour, you still got to be sharp and thinking and interacting with people and interacting with crew. So yeah, it's nothing if not an ongoing challenge. And if you don't love it, get out of it because the hours are too long and sometimes the pay is too low. Hey, yes. look, I, I have not been rich. I'm not a rich person. My college friends who went into law and medicine and real estate and investment and Wall Street and uh, banking, all of this stuff, um, you know, many of them are retired, probably comfortably. And I've, I'm not, uh, but I've always paid my bills. I make it a point to pay the crew members first before I pay myself. So I have excellent credit. There's always a little bit left over because some degree of business management, I think is important with any enterprise that you're undertaking. So I always make sure I've budgeted things out carefully, uh, hired the right people, paid them well, paid them on time. And then with what's left, I pay myself and I'm comfortable. I'm not rich, but I'm comfortable. And uh, I know how to, I never take on more than I can handle or, you know, pay in terms of the expenses and the budget and so forth. So that's another reason why I've outlasted many of my competitors. And I'm very quick to, to follow technology updates. So when film was transferring over to digital, I made it my business to really learn about that, learn how it was going to change uh, the speed of production, the cost of production, and embrace the new technology, not resist it, embrace it, figure out what I can take from my past experience and apply it using the new tools. Another reason why I've outlasted a lot of people, um, but more than anything, I still kind of like doing it. And uh, if anything, there were times when I was a little more of a workaholic than uh then in retrospect, I might have preferred from the standpoint of, you know, uh, su sustaining a divorce. I've been divorced for a number of years, um, but I do have four kids uh, that I'm close to, and I make it a point to stay close to them and very involved in what they're doing. Um, but yeah, when you, you know, enjoy something to the degree that I've done, uh, I, I think I've been guilty of of probably putting in too many hours in the past at times. Yeah, I was about to ask that too. But don't worry, I'm going to, we're going to work together, Bill. I'm going to cast you for the Golden Bachelor on ABC. <laughs> You're going to be the next Golden Bachelor. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, no. I, I, I may be a little too old for that. No, enterprise. no. There's no such age limit when it comes to fun and love. And mm -hmm. we got you for 2024. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Bill, it's funny you said that. Um, it's interesting, I should say, that you said that. Let's back up a little bit. You spoke about technology and being in tune, knowing when to shift with technology. So I was curious. Let's talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, AI. Ooh, do yeah. you believe? Yes, I know that's a scary word, right? But do you believe, especially now in 2024, um, do you think it's really going to take away some of those directing jobs, acting jobs? What is your perspective on AI? Well, I do follow it. I'm a news hound. So, you know, I read the New York Times, the Boston Globe and the Washington Post every day. And I make it my business to watch a few newscasts in the evening, everything from one of the networks to CNN to MSNBC. I just sample it around to the, the PBS NewsHour. I love news and information. I'm very punched into world events. And um, I have followed the whole AI controversy, watched it with interest. I've never used it yet. I'm curious. Because people are creating all sorts of incredible, almost art images oh, with it. Yeah. They're they're sort of playing around with scripts. They can you can have AI do jokes for you. Um, I I don't totally know what to make of it. I actually doubt that AI is ever going to be to the point where it replaces a director, where it replaces the real heart and you know comic soul of something. I don't see that happening, but it probably can speed along some aspects 
of the business. Uh, as far as AI created art, I almost don't even have an opinion about that. I don't know. I'm not a very good artist. I can't draw. I'd be terrible doing storyboards even. Uh, I try to have the plan all up in here. Uh, but I have the feeling that we're all going to be finding some use for AI sooner rather than later. It hasn't happened to me yet, but I sure do follow it with a great deal of interest. As we should, as we all should. You know, I'm curious, Bill, what is your take on the writer's strike? I know that was so long ago, so many years ago, but um, what is your take on it from a producer's perspective? Well, and you can be candid and the honest. You know, the single most important part of film, theater, drama is writing. Writing is where it all starts. The writers have the most power in Hollywood whether it's Shonda Rhimes or David E. Kelly or whoever it is, they're running the show. The writers, it's all about the writing. Uh, it has to be on the page and then you build from there. It's possible to have a bad script and good actors and get away with it, but it's a heck of a lot easier if you have a good script to begin with. So writing, I recommend at every stage, uh, even if you're just pitching yourself or describing yourself or pitching an idea or whether it's a commercial or anything else, I think the writers are the fundamental basis for all successful endeavors in this field. So I was totally in support of their efforts to be paid and compensated better. Um, I mean, I, I'm not in the union, but I do a lot of writing. I, I, I consider it important. And uh, people already tell me when I, you know, I still, I don't like to text a lot because my messages are too long. It's faster mm -hmm. for my hands to type it out. So I'm still emailing and people are always telling me, geez, your emails are so long. You like, most people just like a few sentences. You're, you're sending two and three paragraphs. Right. Yeah, I'm a writer. I'm a talker and I can type as fast as I talk. So, um, so I, you know, writing is paramount to me. Um, and I'm glad they got theirs first. The actors similarly compensated for, for their efforts and protection against their images being used by AI, which I think was very important. Um, yeah, but you know, I was all in favor of that. Awesome. Awesome. So are you, is there a reason why you're not a part of the union? I'm just curious. Well, I'm actually in the union for crew grips and gaffers. This, it's called IATSE. Uh, and I, uh, I don't personally get that much work because I'm usually the producer director, but it helps when I'm going around the country and I'm setting up crews to do a, a, like a TV commercial or, or something like that, that if it ends up being a union shoot, it, uh, it's very helpful for me to be going to the local union reps and say, Hey, yeah, I'm a union guy. I'm in IATSE as a, as a location scout. I pay my dues. Um, and that, uh, you know, automatically I'm, I'm talking their own language. Um, but in terms of, no, I'm not in the director's union. I'm not in the producer's union. That That's a much higher level. That's usually for the Hollywood types um, who it's much more expensive to be involved in that. Uh, I'm in, I'm one of the grip in front of the, you know, the all purpose categories. IATSE includes grips and gaffers and art designers and sound people and camera assistants and, you know, camera operators. And, and those are the ones that make the movies, honestly. Yeah, they're so really on the front lines. Absolutely. Front lines. Absolutely. That's kind of what I relate to. I'm, I'll pick up, I started out as a cameraman. And even when I'm purely directing, I'm still thinking like a cameraman and I can pick up any camera at any time and know what to do with it. That's amazing. Wow. All right. So let's switch gears a little bit. New year, new you. What is the new year going to bring? What do you expect out of the new year? What are you manifesting? Do you even know what manifestation is? <laughs> That's a new word. A lot of folks. Well, it's an election year. Uh, and I'm one of my side things. See, I, I do so many different types of production. I did a fundraising film for an organization that teaches kids with disabilities how to ski last year um but i also do a lot of production on the on the political front because there's a, a demo one of the democratic consultants out of washington 
likes to use me when he, he needs to get new candidates to relax on camera and to help them communicate well on camera or involving real people, that sort of thing. So I tend to get a fair amount of work in election years. Um, I mean, and in the coming election year, I, you know, they, they're going to pay me, but I'd work for nothing. I mean, I'm, I'm concerned enough about, uh, you know, Donald Trump and, and the MAGA movement and the, the damage I perceive it could do to our democracy that I'd be, I want to be on the front lines. I mean to be on the front lines. I'm going to do my part on that front. Um, I actually used to be reasonably conservative, uh, voted Republican a number of times, but uh, today's Republican Party is not, it doesn't have the same priorities uh, that uh, the party had a few 20, even 15, 20 years ago. And so I've become a dedicated independent. And uh, those are the types of causes and uh, candidates that I generally like to support. So yeah, I'm going to be involved in that this coming year. Um, That's amazing. I also, and yeah. I mean, no, I certainly I've got plans to, you know, visit a daughter who's over in college in Paris, France. I'm going to look in on her. I've got another daughter out in Arizona who's uh, works uh, in, in technology and in data management, statistics and so forth, and has a three year old son, my first grandson. I want to be able to spend more time with with him in the coming years. So that's kind of what's on the agenda. I love that. Man, when I grow up, I want to be like you, Bill. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. So, um, you know, you spoke a little bit about life and the journey of life and so forth. Let's talk a little bit about your career as it relates to a listener that might be listening. It's a new year. So some folks might be transitioning into a new career. I know when I was younger, uh, I didn't tell you this, but when I was younger, I really wanted to be a Hollywood star. Oh, yes, Bill. Oh, I used to act. I would sing. I would dance. And everyone would tell me, you're going to go to Hollywood. Even my teacher, like one of my school teachers, like I think um, junior high, he wrote in my yearbook, Kamisha, the superstar. I'll wow. see you in Hollywood. <laughs> Not quite there yet, but... <laughs> but um. As we think about career journeys and new career path, as it's a new year, what would be your advice for a young person that might want to move into the movie making business? How should that person start? Well, as a career, almost everybody that I know starts as a production assistant, the lowest paid or even unpaid in some situations. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I basically say, take on as much responsibility as they will let you take on and over deliver, do it better. Whether it's getting the coffee for people, whether it's picking up somebody from the airport, whether it's uh, helping the uh, gaffer hold a white card in place, a bounce card that put light on the side of somebody's face. If, if the grip is tied up and they ask you to hold the card, just do a really good job. People, people notice when you do a good job. And even though you really would like to be the writer and the director, but you're being hired at the production assistant level, you, every time you impress somebody with your work ethic, it's it's probably going to lead to more opportunities. So that's the start. Now, I had an opportunity to uh, write and direct uh, my own little dramatic short. It was like a 23-minute film a few years ago. And it was on a subject that was kind of dear to my heart about the importance of writing letters. The fact that people don't write letters much anymore. They just text or they do TikTok or they do Instagram and Facebook and email and everything else. And people don't sit down and take a, take a pen or take their typewriter and like write a personal letter to somebody. So it was told from the standpoint of a, of a lifelong mail service delivery guy, a mailman who uh, was kind of following in his father's footsteps and has always thought that he was doing a really important thing. But now he finds himself really just delivering bills and marketing materials and election flyers and stuff like that. And uh, in, in the course of the half hour film, he rediscovers kind of how important what he does is. And, uh, you know, we I, I wrote it with a, a good friend who 
felt the was dedicated to writing as well and we wanted to to write it with some interesting characters that a lot of folks could relate to and we didn't have much money this is not somebody paying us to do it we were doing it ourselves but we hired as our crew i had one experienced person working with me uh, the director of a director of photography who i had worked with for years on a lot of different projects but all of our crew we hired we went to the local colleges and and put out a flyer to your film students you know are you interested in working on a little dramatic film and we interviewed them and we tried to pick people for who were interested in art to help with the art design people who were interested in the camera aspect to be assistant camera people uh, a, a person interested in writing and theater I, I she became my assistant director on the thing so the entire crew was all young people who were kind of working on their first legitimate little drama and they thought they were working for nothing okay they were willing to do it for nothing but i believe i mean my own philosophy was no if we hire you we're going to pay you we're going to pay you each 250 dollars a day now if you were big time film crew grips and gaffers and film people you'd be getting seven or eight hundred dollars a day to start but you're not that experienced we're going to pay you 250 a day we're going to feed you a good lunch the days are going to be long eight, 10, 12 hour days at times. And, but you're going to get a lot of experience and we're going to give you credit. You're going to be prominently credited at the end. So we expect you to put in a good day's work. You can go out and party at night if you want, just be there on time, 7 a.m. Uh, on the next shoot day. And it worked out great. The people we picked, we uh, they they all really took it seriously. When you're paying somebody, Man, they take it seriously. They weren't getting Absolutely. paid a lot, but they approached it professionally. It was a really good experience for them. It was a great experience for me. I love working with young people. And the film was really successful. It went around to like 45 different film festivals around the world. It won a bunch of awards, not so much from the film juries, but it won the Audience Choice Awards at a lot of festivals which i loved it was like yes. hey, that's i'm reaching the people i wanted to reach they they got the message they thought it was uh they cried at the right times they laughed at the right times man you know that was uh, i loved that the audience choice award was my favorite and each one of those people got a credit the young people who worked on it they got a credit that they could take to somebody else and say hey i did this on this a little film that Bill Idolot was making. And if it's local in the Boston area, people would know me. And so automatically that that is very helpful to them. They've got a, a creditable, experienced, respected producer who gave them work and would endorse them. So they'd refer people to me and I'd be happy to give them a reference. That is one way you get into the business. You do that with more people than just me. Other production companies, you know, some of them doing industrial, some doing ad uh, ads for advertising agencies, and you gradually, if you keep over delivering, you're going to get more responsibility, and before you know it, you're going to be an assistant producer, you're going to be an assistant director, you're going to be the director, um, and everybody I know who's been able to work into the business has gone that route. That that is, but there have been plenty who dropped out because it wasn't that rewarding for them. They didn't like the long hours. Um, they didn't feel they were, you know, moving along fast enough. But in those situations, you're able to study people who are already in the business and professionals, and you learn from them by watching what they do and how they contribute to the project. And that plants a, a seed in your brain in the future is, well, I could, I could do something. Or I could contribute that way to somebody else's project. Wow. Uh, there's no, so gold, I... there's no golden pathway, uh, but that's generally the proven way that you get into the business. So what I heard is uh, getting into the business as you all are thinking, as we all are thinking about a new year, as we transition into a new journey, be humble. Start, even if you have to start from the lowest point. For yeah. example, if you want to go into movie business, production assistant, start, but do a great job even at that point. Yes. 
I love that. And I think that is so imperative today, um, especially in our culture where especially young people, they want to be the, the box office famous director from the start. Like they want to make the box from the beginning. They don't want to start yeah, from the bottom. That's not going to happen. Yeah. That's, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the young woman who was the, who was at Boston university uh, at the time we did that short, uh, like four or five years ago, she was the assistant director to me on the project. She's now directing ads. She's moved to New York. She's producing her own documentary at this point. Um, but, you know, she had been just a production assistant on a couple of earlier projects, too. So and she's just one of a number of of young people who, who went on and are doing set up their own little companies or and you know they're not big budget at this point but in the digital world you don't need a big budget you can if you know what you're doing you can use one of these to tell a pretty good story iphone yes and um yes. so you know i'm it's very rewarding to me to see where some of these folks have gone in the aftermath of our little project i love it I'm curious, what do you, as we, you know, wrap up, how do you approach a script? What do you look for in a really good enticing script? Well, I can tell you just from my own preferences. Look, I don't care much for the superhero movies in general. They they just bore the heck out of me because it's like, I'm going to pay all this money and basically just sit in the theater and watch a whole lot of special effects. Um, I mean, the special effects people have their place, but I, I appreciate special effects when it has more to do with setting up a historical time we you know with a background painting a background that that puts you back in the 16th century or the 18th century or you know uh, in another world the explosions the throwing of buses around and so that i just find it so boring so i mean when i'm looking for a script i'm looking for a script that has real character in it a character who changes over the course of the drama who starts at one place but is gradually absorbing and reacting to things in a way that causes some degree of change and complexity in that character and good dialogue i mean good dialogue is hard to write when when i read it i know it <laughs> but i'm not all that great about writing it myself at times but and when, on a, my own little script, I rewrote that script and rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. I kept trying to improve it and say, oh, that's too trite. That's so, you know, I've, I, I need to find a, a different way for that person to express themselves. And uh, that's why writing, again, figures so critically. But, you know, really good, intelligent, incisive dialogue and characters with depth and complexity who undergo some sort of change in the course of the story. That's what I would look for. Wonderful complexity. I love that. I love that. I'm curious, Bill. Recently, there's been a lot of celebrities, artists, musicians that have been, for example, the Taylor Swift of the world, Beyonce. Um, I also believe um, the group BTS, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah. So those big um, celebrities, they have been producing their own concerts oh yeah and so right and now they sell it to like a movie you know where we as a public or fans can go and see it and watch it i'm curious as to that business model do you believe you'll see more of that in the upcoming year i do and and, and, and my question is definitely how can a smaller brand may not be millions we may not have millions of followers or fans but we have what you just said content really good content how can a smaller brand sell their intellectual property to a bigger organization like a movie or you know producers like an amazon for example how can well in general those outfits aren't going to look at what you submit to them unless it kind of comes courtesy of a professional agent because they don't want to get sued for being accused of taking your idea. 
I ran into that years ago when I sent some stuff to Steven Spielberg saying, you know, as I said earlier, hey, boy, we have a lot in common. And look, you're going to really like these adventure commercials that I did that have sort of stunts in them and like their humor and everything. I think you'll you'll relate to it. Well, I the, he sent me back. The, his company sent me back the tapes that I sent to him and said, thanks very much for your interest. But we are really unable to, you know, they didn't even look at them. They did not even look at them. That would be the case today as well, because there's so many lawsuits going around. So one of the tricks, if you're pitching, you know, an outfit like Netflix or Hulu or Amazon or whatever, it helps if you've got something that you can take to an agent and get the agent interested in it, because the agent will get the, they will be heard. Those folks will take the agent's phone call. And there's a certain protocol for submitting something where it's everybody understands how it's protected. There's a legal way to submit it, that there's a, a protection built in. That's why it's very difficult for you to just pick up the phone or, or text one of these people and say, I have this idea. Well, whoa, 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 whoa. don't tell me the idea until we're, we're in a the proper presentation context. So yeah, if you're good enough to be able to get an agent interested, that is the proven way to get your idea in front of one of these outfits. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh my gosh, Bill, you you have such a wealth of knowledge. Like, I feel like I can pick your brain apart. It's, it's really amazing. I just want to thank you certainly for taking this time to speak with us and speak with me. Like, thank you. Well, you're I welcome. I love to encourage folks. And, uh, you know, we, we have so much new talent coming available. That's what the streaming services and the digital world has opened up. There's all these people who never thought of doing something like this, uh, who are doing podcasts. I mean, my God, more power to Taylor Swift and Beyonce to be, not only did they do the tours right. and employed all of those musicians yes. and all of those lighting people and all Amazing. of those truckers really making a contribution to the economy economy yes of the united yes. states of america and cities all these yes. cities that they went yes. to but they they did it their way they were creatively involved yes everybody made good money gosh, gosh taylor swift paid the truck drivers a hundred thousand each for crying out loud i mean i just loved that in terms of supporting the people and and yes. getting everybody invested in it and arguably these two women kind of saved movie theaters Ooh. because I mean, AMC, they both worked deals with AMC where they get to keep, you know, they got like 30% of the take and the theaters got 40 or 50% because of course the theaters are, you know, have, I've got the, the overhead and so forth. Um, and it's been great for the theater companies. It was great for the individual performers. It's exciting. Their fans are, enjoying the music people who couldn't buy tickets to the actual concerts i mean how many ways can you win on this i mean mm. more power to you and then time magazine picks taylor swift as a person, person of, of the, the year, year. Yes. in an otherwise year where there was a lot of bad news that was good news i mean part yes. of the articles relates to beyonce and some other performers doing the same yes. thing it was like creating joy for uh at the same time that you're creating jobs and yes. helping the economy i mean a project just doesn't get any better than that so i'm i'm in awe of of what some of these creative uh folks have accomplished and the, the way they they're doing it in movie theaters for crying out loud who knew who knew i love it i love it where do you see the art of movie making where do you see that art in the future where do i well I mean, you're going to start to see some of the streaming services consolidate because they're having, you know, there's so much competition. Uh, this, uh, we're going to be looking at more and more on our computers and our TVs and, you know, on your flat screen and so forth. Um, it, we're just going to see more of it. And and also more documentaries are going to uh, be able to, to find uh, audiences and services that will screen them. Um, because the digital equipment gets better every single year, um, it means that uh, budgets actually will probably come down. So more, you won't need huge budgets to do good work. 
I mean, I just watched a film online a few nights ago called The Holdovers with uh, about these kids, you know, stuck at a prep school when they're, you know, over the holidays and the relationships that develop with the grouchy teacher uh, and the cook uh, and, uh, you know, little, just a little film not a damn single special effect but just full of character i they wouldn't have needed a big crew to shoot it didn't they were looks like they were using available light in many settings but uh well, gosh what a wonderful uh uh story terrific acting good dialogue and wouldn't have cost that much to shoot so i think we're going to see I hope we're going to see more work of that nature. I certainly support that. I might get a shot at making something like that. Uh, and if I had the right script, I'd sure want to take a crack at it. But you got to have a good script to begin with. I go back to the writing. Uh, you know, it all starts with the script. And a good script is the hardest thing to come by. I agree. I agree. Man, I just want to thank you so much. Um, I got one more question and I think we're going to wrap it up here. I want you to talk about difficulty. How, how have you handled a difficult conflict in your career? How have you handled that conflict to turn it into positive as well, we wrap up? A couple of different ways. First of all, I tell anyone, if you're going into a film shoot, everybody has their plan A for what they want to do. I've learned from a lot of experience. Also have a plan B and a plan C and be prepared to improvise with a plan D. It happens all the time based on weather, performance, other logistics, noise. You know, it, there's all sorts of reasons why you have to be prepared. Go in as prepared as possible and know what your fallbacks are gonna be in terms of how you're gonna shoot something. Um, I arguably, when somebody asks me, what did you make any big mistakes? Yeah, arguably, I might have. I produced one of the first totally independent films in America. Back in, I shot it in 1978 and was released in 1980. It was called The Return of the Secaucus Seven. And it was the work of a young writer-director named John Sayles, who I was introduced to. He had never made a film before, ever. But he'd written some novels, had gotten some notice, he'd written short stories, he'd won some awards, and with the money he made from those awards, he was willing to throw all of that money into this film that he'd written. And he, re he wrote it with certain friends in mind, theater friends, college friends, um, but he'd never made a film before. And I had the know-how to make the film. And we shot the whole thing with like a six person crew with everybody wearing two or three hats. You know, you weren't just a grip or a gaffer. You were, you know, an art person. You were costumes. I wasn't just the producer. I was the camera operator and the guy doing the initial editing uh, on syncing up the dailies. And I hired everybody. Uh, so it was super low budget, but it was really well received. Uh, it got all sorts of national awards. It launched John Sayles' career, who went on to do a number of other films. And it, But in the immediate aftermath, I always thought of myself as the person who just kind of made it, pulled the strings to make his vision happen. But I wasn't the director. He was the writer-director. He even played a role in the film. So in the aftermath of it, I thought, oh, well, I, you know, I need to keep practicing my director chops. He ended up doing more writing and directing more films. At that point, given the success, the critical success, it made the, that film made the 10 best lists of many publications in 1980. I should have gone to Hollywood. I should have gone to Los Angeles at that point and said, hey folks, I'm the guy who produced the, the Secaucus 7. I made that happen for a song for less than the donut budget on a Paramount production. And I didn't do that. I stayed in Boston thinking, well, I, you know, I'm known around here. I'll, I'll be a big fish in a small pool and learn my craft that way. And that plan worked out, that latter plan. That worked out okay. But I sometimes ask myself, boy, what if I had gone to LA when that film was, you know, everybody was talking about it yeah. and said, hey, I'm, I'm a producer. I can direct, you know, I didn't do that. Um, 
if I had something to do over again, if I if it was given a do over, I probably will have learned my lesson on that front. I didn't have enough confidence confidence in myself, I think, at that point to 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 make that jump. Um, it still worked out for me in the long run. I got to keep doing what I loved, but not at the same level <laughs> as uh, as the Steven Spielbergs of the world and so forth. So uh, still been very satisfying, but I think we all face some crossroads along the way and you make the best judgment you can and then live with it um, and make the best of it. And that's kind of what I've done. And I don't really have any regrets, but if if I had to come up with one one, you know, split in the road on a snowy night, I I probably would have taken the chance and gone out to uh, LA and done a little more tuning of my own horn at that point. I missed an opportunity. Well, so what? Next. <laughs> no. And you know, there is something to be said about that, but there's also, I'm not sure how spiritual you are or even to our listeners, but there's something about God makes no mistakes. And I think, you know, the poem, Footprints in the Sand, yeah. it talks about that, you know, that uh, God makes no mistakes. Your life journey and your life path, the pathways that he crafted was meant for you. I think the beautiful thing about our correspondence, and we just really, you know, know each other or whatever the case may be, is that that humility goes a long way. And that humility also provides longevity. And I think sometimes when we are, we go into big places like the LA's, like the New York, right? Like, you know what, when you go into those industries, you sometimes can be jaded. You sometimes can be caught up with the Harvey Weinsteins of the world. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not to take it to that level, but to say this, Sometimes, you know, when you are chasing certain things or chasing fame or the power, whatever the case may be, you lose yourself. And I think the beautiful thing with you and what I see and what I've experienced in our correspondence is that humility. And that humility may not be the same had you become some big time. Oh, no. Yeah. 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 Hollywood producer. And I said the same thing for me. Um, I experienced that as well. I am super talented. Everyone that knows me and interact always says the same thing. But here I am, and here you are. So that humility goes a long way, and God makes no mistakes. Bill, any last words as we wrap up? <laughs> well, no, I certainly sign on to that. I also, there can be a lot of, in the film business, there are a lot of huge egos and a fair amount of nasty people. And I've always tried to run a set full of humor and, you know, with kindness to all. And I make a point of asking many crew members for their opinion. You know, if you're trying to figure out how to do something, talk to the grips and the gaffers. They've been on a million shoots. They have worked with a lot of directors. They may have ideas you haven't thought of. So I love to invite others uh to offer their suggestions and when they have a good suggestion i'll usually say you know what i like that i'm gonna say that was my idea no in, in truth um i i i love to make it a a truly shared enterprise and uh yeah i don't really have any regrets i'm grateful that i'm allowed to keep doing what i'm doing at my age and i intend to keep myself reasonably fit so i can do it for a while longer and not every project is a super success, but they're usually pretty good and they usually lead to something else. And that's pretty satisfying overall. And that's all we can ask for. William Adelot, president of Waverly Motion Pictures, writer, producer, on-air talent, director, and most importantly, an incredible human being. I want to thank you so much for this candid conversation on the Chop It Up podcast. I know our listeners are going to be intrigued. I am definitely lifted and motivated for the new year. William, Bill, I yes. wish you happy, happy new year. All the best. I hope this is not the last of our friendship. 
Okay. I hope I can email you a long email and you do answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my answer will probably be too long. But Commissioner, enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Good luck with the podcast. Hope you have a great uh, 2024 and, and a healthy one as well. So enjoyed our conversation. Likewise. You guys, thank you so much for joining the Chop It Up podcast and listening. I want to thank all of you for supporting us for the last four years. We have made it. Thank you so much. Guys, like, subscribe. And this time, we are going to be giving away a $50 gift card. Yes, we're going to be giving away a $50 gift card. All you have to do is listen to this episode and reach out to us in social media. Tell us how you enjoyed it. And we will mail you out that $50 gift card. It's a pleasure. My name is Kamisha Superville, host of the Chop It Up podcast. See you on the next episode, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.